Mike over here. There we go. Okay, I want to call your attention to a few of the announcements that we have this morning. And one is that the uh, sign-up sheet is in the foyer for the clothes closet. If you are willing to come and to work at the clothes closet, we invite you to put your name on the list. And also, I want to remind you about the blessing bags that uh, Lingen Ministries gives out to the poor. And um, there are some items, by the way, on the table in the back in the foyer. But we really need to kind of beef that up a little bit and be more involved in helping them as they are reaching out and ministering to the poor and the needy. So uh, get with Jenny, or I think you can see a full list or talk to her of the kinds of items that they like putting in those bags. And uh, let's all participate and help her as she helps others. We don't live in Wichita, so we don't have the access to the homeless as she does uh, by living in Wichita. And so let's participate in the way that we can and help her. And also, if you have prayer requests, let Kimberly Haynes know, and she'll put them in the following Sunday's bulletin. We do have some requests we'll bring forth today. But I also want to remind you that last Sunday night, we were looking at the theology of theocracy, which just means God manifesting himself to man. And we had a very good lesson about theocracy, and we asked that we're going we're gonna to do it again tonight. We're going to be talking about theocracy. And I have asked the class if they would come with stories to share of times or ways that God has revealed himself to you. And I, even in the class last week, uh, that there were some that as they begin to look at the stories in the Old Testament, and then they look back at events in their own life, they begin to realize God's hand in their lives. And we want to discuss that. So bring your stories. If you have a special story to share, uh, we would love to hear it that encourages each other. So tonight at 6 o'clock, if you'd like to be a part of that. That's all I've got by way of announcements this morning, and you ladies will have to excuse Jim Ann as she comes, and she's going to begin our service with the reading of the Word of God. This is from Exodus 20. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God punishing the children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day, by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, not your animals, not any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Amen. Amen. And let's honor our God this morning by worshiping him. And let's begin with this very wonderful chorus. Yes, I know. I hope that you know today. Sinners lost and lonely. Jesus' blood can make you free. For he said, The worst among you. When he saved a wretch like me. And I know, oh yes, I know. 
Jesus' blood can make the vilest sinner free. And I know, yes I know, yes I know, Jesus' blood can make the vilest sinner free. To the faith he giveth continue praying for Bev's friend David uh, fighting cancer but uh, has an infection that is really 
making that difficult and not doing well. So we want to pray for David. And also, Bev has asked that we would pray for her, for her health. And of course, we want to continue to keep Tom and Jenny both in our prayers as well. And little Eliza, if you haven't met Eliza, uh, you'll see her back there in the arms of a young lady. And uh, she has some special health needs, and we need to keep her in our prayers. I know that I'm vague, but according to what we're trying to practice now, we're going to be vague. We do have three families that I know of that are traveling and uh, vacation time. And so we want to keep them in our prayers and asking for God to uh, protect them in their journeys. We do have some praise points, and one is the successful return of Jenny and Daughters. Yay! Their car is repaired as well, so God has worked out all of that. And appreciate Luther going with me last week. And, and uh, I think it was a God thing because we found uh, very quickly in Branson a car tote, so he was able to get it back. We, we were afraid we may have to go into a big city like Springfield and spend a lot of time going around looking for that car tote, but God provided and we're able to get them back. And, um, and then another praise point. Jenny had a sister that had been missing for a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, up in the area where the riots are really, really bad and the whole family was concerned, the children actually called and turned it into the police and they went on a search for her. And finally she showed up. Now I don't know the story, probably she deserves a whipping for not letting anybody know where she was. But I'm here to tell you that is a praise point. She is found and she's alive and well. Praise be to God for that. And Kimmy's going to share a few of the requests. Now you have the full list in your bulletins, you know, to take home. But she's going to highlight a few of the prayer requests in regards to missions. We want to be praying for people that are in a path of Hurricane Isaiah. Um, in Puerto Rico, more than... 400,000 homes and businesses have lost power already. Be praying for them. Be praying for the, uh, the child development programs in Mexico and also be praying for the, uh, the children living in poverty in 62 different countries and all the child focused programs are out work trying to help them to have a better life. Thank you. Let's all stand and prepare our hearts for prayer this morning as we sing together. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and all these things. Heavenly Father, as we come before you today, we want to thank you, Father, for answered prayer. We thank you, Father, for a successful journey of going to Branson and bringing back these ladies and answered prayer that it was not something so major in the car that it would be uh, something that's unfixable. But, Father, their transportation is back for the needed hospital or doctor visits that they have to go to. And, Father, we do pray that you would just be with Tom and that you would be with Jenny. That you would be with little Eliza, Father. You know the concerns in this family. We're praying, oh God, that you would reach down with the healing hand of God. Tonight we're going to be talking about how God manifests himself in many of our lives. And sharing our stories that will encourage each other's faith. And Father, we come today and we are praying that you would manifest your power. That you would manifest your strength in the lives of these that we bring before you today. We pray for healing to be upon them. We think of David and pray, Father, that you would just drive this infection from his body so that the treatments for cancer would be able to continue. We pray for Bev and the concerns for her health that she has shared. 
And Father, I think of those that are traveling literally thousands of miles right now of our congregation. Would you protect them from the virus, but also protect them on the road that you would bring them back safely to be with us and be able to worship with us again here in the house of the Lord. Father, we think of our missionaries and these needs that have been brought forth before us today. And we do pray, God, that you would hear and answer prayers for them, but not just for them, but we think, Lord, of the work of missions around the world. And Father, I remember, I remember when I was in New Guinea, the, the feeling of loneliness because you're so far away from family. I used to describe it that the loneliness was so thick you could cut it with a knife. But Father, I pray that you would be with those missionaries right now. And if some of them are feeling a special need or carrying an extra heavy burden, we pray, oh God, that you would draw near to them on this Lord's Day. And that, Father, that you would minister to them at the very point of their needs. May they sense and know your presence in a special way today. Would you bless their work, anoint their work, that they would see fruit for their labors, Lord. And we come together and we commit them, Lord, before you today. And now, Father, as we come before you, we just acknowledge that we are a needy congregation. Father, we need you this morning. We need to hear from you. We need to feel your touch. Would you open our ears and open our eyes that we may see and hear and know what God has for us in this service today. And we commit these requests before you today in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. 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 Okay. Well, let's continue worshiping the Lord, and we're going to start with Blessed Assurance, 442. Isn't that awesome? Amen. Blessed Assurance. Jesus is mine. Jesus is mine. Oh, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, the foretaste of glory divine. Heirs of salvation, purchase of God, born and his spirit, washed in his blood. Well, this is my story, this is my song. testimony. Savior of the day long. This is my 
So if we could sing that again, that would be Well, awesome. you lead it because I already turned the page. Okay. <laughs> Verse 2, guys. Perfect vision, perfect delight, visions of rapture, now burst on my mind. Angels descending, bring from above, echoes of mercy, whisper from love. Oh, this is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior, Father, day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Amen. Come tonight and say more of it. <laughs> 86, the love of God. And I hope everybody really appreciates. I don't know what Clayton did to himself this week, but he sure is pretty this morning. And we're sure glad. <laughs> we're so glad that she's stepping in in something very unfamiliar and taking care of the soundboard back there. Not an easy job. She's taking care of Ava over here and the microphone's up here. She is a multitasker. Let's thank her for her extra help today, shall we? All right. Okay. And isn't she really pretty? Yeah. Don't anybody say no. The love of God. Oh, that's nice. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pain can ever tell. the Lord in our tithes and our offerings.
<coughs> now, Justin, you let me know if you want a verse of this too, because the verses are really short. So I'll look at you if you go. All right. All right. Well, we'll know. He's going to listen to you. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. Brother Luther, would you pray for our offering today? Lord, we thank you for this time, Lord. We have to worship you. Lord, we pray that you bless this offering, Lord, that you meet the need of the church. And Lord, we pray that you bless each one as they give. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> message and song by Sister Kimberly before we hear from God's Word today. a wretch like me I once was lost but now I'm found was blind but now I see Shining as the sun, we know the seas to 
sing God's praise that when we first begone. Thank you so much for that special message and song. And here I stand unprepared. I'm going to try to get better prepared here. And let's see. Nothing like when your wife is can't help can't be here to help you. Testing. Be sure to get my volume down where I don't scare nobody. Yeah, see, I've already scared Larry, but it had nothing to do with my voice. <laughs> The scripture that we're going to be looking at today is going to be out of 2 Kings in chapter 17, and I'll be getting to that passage after a while. I ran across this uh, this week, and it's a very interesting story in the Old Testament, and I believe that this story is just as pertinent for us today as it was to those to whom it was written. I want to give you a little bit of background so you understand what this passage is about. When God established his covenant with Israel, he gave them ten very simple, self-explanatory commands which they must follow. If they failed, they would be cut off from the land that he was giving to them by their, to be theirs by covenant. And it was to be theirs for all time if they would but only obey these commands. The first four of those commands were read at the beginning of the service, and these four have to do with our relationship with God. And that's what I wanted to focus on today because it pertains to the scripture that we're going to be looking at. So, here we find that he starts out, when he talks about the Ten Commandments, he tells us who he is. He says, I'm the one that brought you out. I brought you out of Egypt. I brought you out of slavery. And later we find that he makes slavery to be a symbol of sin. So we could say he brought them out of sin. They understood that. And then he presented his demands, and here they were again, no other gods before me. And he said the reason why, he said, I am a jealous God. I mean, he was up front about that. I am a jealous God, and by that, he was letting us know that he would not entertain any rivals whatsoever. Also, he said, no idols made by your hands at which you bow down and worship, and don't misuse my name, and then keep the Sabbath as a holy day. Why? For the purposes of worshiping our God. Simple and clear and precise. And yet at the same time, considering the first two, Israel had consistently violated these commands, and they were consistently worshiping other gods. They were consistently worshiping foreign gods, foreign deities of the inhabitants of the land before them. When they came into the land, some of the inhabitants remained, and they continued to worship their gods, and Israel was led astray. Can you imagine that? The same Israel that was one generation before, just simply one generation before, had led the people into freedom and taken them across the desert and gave them the land of promise. And just a generation later, here they are, worshiping the gods of the inhabitants of the land the false deities of the nation surrounding them. They looked around and they said, but look over there, they're worshiping Astaroth, and look over there, they're worshiping this God or that God, and we want to worship those gods just like they do. It seems that every one of the fallacies of Israel is that they always wanted to be just like everybody else. Now let me point out that I think that we have that problem still yet today. When we look at other countries, sometimes we see something about them that we want to be just like them. But let me bring it down to more spiritual matters. That we, even in the church, sometimes we look at the world around them, and in some way, or in some measure, we want to be just like them. Remember when they asked for a king? 
You remember why they asked for a king? Now, now when God brought them into the promised land, he told them, he said, I'm going to be your king. It's what you call a theocracy. Theo meaning God and Cressy meaning government. And so he meant for them to establish a theocracy where every time they had an issue, they would simply go to God and God would tell them what to do. That sounds primary to me. Amen. Don't you wish we had a theocracy today? Just let God be your leader as a nation. But the reason that they wanted a king, and they expressed it very plainly, and it was this, we want a king just like all the other nations. So again, we want to be just like them. They have a king, they have a king, they have a king. We don't have a king. Why don't we have a king? And so they begin to come to God and complain, and God even forewarned them, and he said the kings will bring hardship on the people. They're going to put a burden on your back that you're going to wish you did not have, and they're going to start taxing. Right there, I think I would have been ready to say no. <laughs> but they're going to bring a hardship on the people. And kings, the kings of Israel often proved to be their ruin as a nation, even spiritually. Sometimes a king would come along that didn't want to worship Jehovah God at all and would lead them away into Baal and all other false religions. And then a king might come along that says, well, I'm going to reestablish the worship of Jehovah. And their spiritual life was up and down and up and down and up and down, much like many people in our world today. Amen. And God warned them about this. But God relented because they kept coming to him, saying, we want to be just like everybody else. And he relented and he appointed a king because at the root, they just wanted to be like everybody else. In 1 Kings chapter 18 <coughs> and verse 21, I apologize, got a little bit of a dry throat up here. So I'm going to get a little bit of drink. I hope it doesn't sound too bad. Well, well did it? <laughs> First Kings in chapter 1, sorry, chapter 18 and verses 8 through 21 in the New International Version. Now, I've gone back to 1 Kings for just a moment. The story is going to be in 2 Kings, but I wanted you to understand that this was written about 858 years before Christ. So we have a timeline. They know that because they look in, in secular history books and often in the Old Testament and say during the reign of this king or during the reign of this king this happened. So they can actually backtrack and give you a date. And written about 858 B.C., <coughs> God voiced his grievance with the people through the prophet Elijah. And this is what he said. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. Wow, I'm going to read that again. If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. Now the children of Israel had at that time already been violating the true worship of Jehovah for who knows how long. But they had been doing this long enough that Elijah came and he gave them this warning. The same idol that some of them had worshipped while they were in slavery in Egypt. I mean, this is an idol from Egypt. And while they were slaves in Egypt, some of them began to worship Baal because that's who the Egyptians worshipped. And maybe if they worshipped the same God, the Egyptians might have pity and compassion on them. And so they were going back to the false god of their slavery. I do not understand that. I mean, if you're going to pick another false god, don't make it the one that held you in bondage and in slavery. Of course, the truth of the matter is, if you really study the word of God and you go back to its original language, any false god, become you become a slave to it. If you worship any false god, you become a slave to it. And they have been violating these commands by worshiping idols and worshiping by uh, Baal. And uh, like a dog that returns to its vomit, they continue to return to their slavery to Baal. Now, 2 Kings in chapter 17 was written 133 years later. And again, they know the timeline. So here's Elijah, 
And he's given them this warning. If God be God, then worship him. But if Baal be God, then worship him. And 133 years, years later, he sends another prophet, and they have to say the same thing all over again. Not to the Israelites this time, but to strangers in the land. Now, this is not something that I had seen before. But 133 years after Elijah had given this warning, God finally said, enough is enough. I've told you, and I've told you, and I've told you, and obviously you've made your choice. And he sent the Assyrian army into the northern kingdom, and they were carried away into captivity to never be heard from again. Now, the southern kingdom was still there. The southern kingdom, however, was later carried away into Babylonian captivity for the same reason. But the northern kingdom was carried away. And 133 years after Elijah first gave the warning, here he comes and they receive the same warning. And they are carried away because they did not listen to the warnings of God. And they did not get rid of the false gods of the lands that surrounded them. Well, it's interesting because actually what happened there is that, uh, well, I'll just start at verse 7 in 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 7. All this took place because the Israelites had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them up out of Egypt from under the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. They worshipped other gods and followed the practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before them, as well as the practices that the kings of Israel had introduced. The Israelites secretly, do you catch that? The Israelites secretly did things against the Lord their God that were not right. From watchtower to fortified city, they built themselves high places in all their towns. Now let me explain to you that a high place didn't mean it was just high in elevation. It was high in elevation, but these were temples. They would go into the mountains and they would build temples to these false gods. And when you hear a reference to the high places, they're talking about temples that they had built so they could go and worship at the feet of idols. So again, they were not worshiping their God. They set up sacred stones and Ashtaroth poles on every high hill and under every spreading tree. At every place they burned incense as the nations whom the Lord had driven out before them had done. And they did wicked things that aroused the Lord's anger. They worshipped idols, though the Lord had said, You shall not do this. The Lord warned Israel and Judah through all his prophets and seers, Turn from your evil ways. Observe my commands and decrees in accordance with the entire law that I commanded your ancestors to obey and that I delivered to you through my servants, the prophets. But they would not listen <clears throat> and were as stiff-necked as their ancestors who did not trust the Lord their God. So what did God do? He sent punishment upon them and they were defeated by the Assyrians or carried away, never to be returned again. And they were forfeited by their own disobedience. God said, that which I have given to you is no longer yours, and you have forfeited the blessings of God by your own disobedience. And in their place, the Syrians sent settlers. They sent pioneers into the land, shall we say. And we see this beginning at verse 24. The king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Cuthath, Ava, Hamath, and there's a name I can't say, and settled them in the towns of Samaria to replace the Israelites. Now that's an interesting strategy because when the Babylonians later on took the southern kingdom, the Bible said that they didn't take everybody. They left a remnant of the Israelites in the southern kingdom because they knew that if all humanity left an area, the weeds and the thorns and the beast of the field would recapture the area and it would no longer be fit for men. Now, the Samaritan king had wisdom, but he took all the Israelites away, but he sent some of his people back. And he said, you guys go, and you settle this land, and you take care of this land. So they took over Samaria and lived in its town. They listen to verse 25. This is interesting. When they first lived there, they did not worship the Lord, 
They might be foreigners, but they were still in God's land, right? They did not worship the Lord. So he sent lions among them, and they killed some of the people. You hear what's happening? The beasts of the field are beginning to come back in, and they're taking over the land. It was reported to the king of Assyria. The people you deported and resettled in the towns of Samaria do not know what the God of that country requires. He has sent lions among them, which are killing them off, because the people do not know what he requires. It's kind of interesting to me, this thought that in their mind, it's like this nation over here had a God that they had to worship in order to get blessings, and this nation over here had a God. No, they didn't understand that I, the king, the, the, the God of God, the king of kings, that he was God of all of the world and not just a very small speck of the world. But at least they were acknowledging, huh, we must be worshiping wrong, right? And so his, his solution was interesting. He said, then the king of Assyria gave this order, have one of the priests you took captive from Samaria go back to live there and teach the people what the God of that land requires. However, I mean, the priest went and he taught them what it meant to worship Jehovah God. They worshiped the Lord in verse 32. They worshiped the Lord, but they also appointed all sorts of other people, of their own people, to officiate for them as priest in the shrines at the high places. Remember that word? All of these places where the Israelites went to worship idols. The Syrians that were brought in, they also, they went out and they worshiped at those high places. The places that the Jews had worshiped, had, had made to build or built to make to worship their idols. They worship the Lord. I like that. Now listen to this. They worship the Lord, but, but, it's always that that gets you, isn't it? They worship the Lord, but they also serve their own gods in accordance with the customs of the nations from which they had been brought. I think they missed a very important part of the commands of God when the priest was trying to teach them what it meant to serve Jehovah. Because one of the big things is, there shall be no other gods before me. I alone am God. And so they didn't listen to the whole of the instruction. And they said, okay, we'll worship Jehovah, but we're going to continue to worship the gods of our land. And I thought about that. Because I think sometimes that happens in Christian circles. I mean, we can come and we can hear the message and we can hear about amazing grace. We can hear about amazing love. We can hear about the church and its mores and its standards. And we can say, yes, okay, I will receive Jesus, but I am going to hold on to the things of this world that my heart does choose to worship. And God comes along and he says, no, that can't happen because I am a jealous God and I will entertain no counterpart. So in verse 40, he says this, they would, not, they would not listen, however, but persisted in their former practices. Even while these people were worshiping the Lord, they were serving their idols. If you really go back to see what it means to worshiping the Lord, you can't worship the Lord unless you are worshiping the Lord exclusively. The people were worshiping the Lord, and they were serving their idols, and to this day their children and grandchildren continue to do this as their ancestors did. As I was reading that, that passage in this story, I realized how pertinent that it is to us today, because here are some reasons. Number one, it is not written to those who were children of God by virtue of birth or by virtue of bloodline, or by virtue that God had established a covenant with them, they were in Assyria. They were all carried away. This story was written about people who are sojourners in the land of Israel, who once belonged to another land, who once worshipped other gods. It's about people who had been adopted into the promised land, and with the exception of Beverly, 
she is, is, is a Jew. She is a Jew, so she is also a child of God by the virtue of her inheritance, of her heritage. But the rest of us who are Gentiles, there's only one reason why you and I are a part of the family of God, and that is that we have been adopted into the family of God. Now, this is what the Bible says. That's the language that it uses, that we have been adopted into the family of God. And so let me see where I was here. So they, they once belonged to another land. They once worshipped other gods, but they've been adopted into the promised land just like us. And as I said, they were not of Jewish descent, but they have been adopted. And I can't help but think that the same warning that God gave to them when they said, well, we'll accept the worship of God in this land, but we're going to continue to worship the things that we hold dear in our heart as well. I, I think that warning comes to us today. And we look in the New Testament and we can see the same. Jesus used these words. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. But he said, you cannot serve both God and money. Now, I went back to the King James on that because that word money is actually mammon, and it has a very special meaning that I think we need to understand. It does not just mean money. It may include money, but it also may include houses and lands, anything that is in the form of wealth or anything that is present in this world. But if you really go back to what it really means, it really means riches or treasure that have been personified. Okay, now that confused me too. And so I thought, so what does it mean to personify wealth or treasure? And so I put it in a more understandable way after my research, and that is a treasure that a person trusts in. If you have put your trust in mammon, or money, or wealth, or fame, or whatever it is that you have put your trust in, that is mammon. And Jesus said we can't serve both God and mammon. Just as in the Old Testament where the priests were trying to teach these Assyrians, you cannot serve God and the idols of your heart. You have to choose one or the other, but you cannot serve uh, both in the truest sense. Matthew twenty two thirty seven, Jesus told us, he said, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. And then in Acts chapter 14, it says, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church and with prayer and fasting committed them to, listen to this, committed them to the Lord in whom they put their trust. In their trust trust. In the spirit of the story of 2 Kings, can I ask you, do you have any secret gods? Now that's the accusation, remember, that he made against the Israelites. Oh, they were worshiping God, but then in secret they would go and they were worshiping other gods. But God knew. You can't hide that from God. Do you have any secret gods? Now, by definition, let me tell you what a false god can be. A false god can be anything that stands more dear to your heart than God. That thing becomes effectively your God. Anything that stands more dear to your heart than God effectively, effectively becomes your God. Or the second, anything that you trust more than God himself is effectively your God. Anything that you trust more than God himself is effectively your God. You know, like one of the songs says, we don't, we don't know who holds tomorrow, but we know who holds my hand. Remember that? And it says, we don't know about tomorrow. It may bring us poverty. 
I mean, I've seen people of massive wealth that in a moment of time, that wealth can disappear. Even Jesus talked about the man who had such a great harvest that he built bigger barns. And he said, you fool, you're trusting in your barns, you're trusting in your crops. This night your very soul shall be, shall be taken account for. Remember that? Jesus talked about that. What are you trusting in? So let me ask some questions. And as I ask these questions, kind of take your spiritual pulse, you know. And you can do that in your mind, or you can, you know, figuratively do it. If you don't know how to do it, Jenny knows how, and Max knows how. But <laughs> just take your spiritual pulse. And I'm going to ask you some questions to help you to investigate your allegiance. What do you love more than anything else in the world? Is it your wife, your children, yourself, your money, your esteem, your popularity, your title? your degree do you love God more than these second question what ob what object brings you the greatest amount of joy I remember years ago seeing a commercial where a man finds a stethoscope and he picks up the stethoscope and he held it up to his heart. He wanted to hear his own heart. And when he put the stethoscope to his heart, he heard the hallelujah chorus. <laughs> I love that commercial. So let me ask you today, if a stethoscope, which heard not only heart but soul, were held up to your breast, what would you hear? Number three. What is most important in your thoughts? Where are your thoughts when the preacher preaches? I've heard apologies. I'm sorry, Pastor, didn't hear a word you said because I had something else on my mind. Let me tell you something. That's not worshiping God. When God tells us to gather together as a body of Christ and offer praise and offer worship and hear from His Word, it's something that we really should take seriously. It's something that I take serious. Wherever your thoughts are, if they're not with the preacher, whatever you were thinking about, that probably defines the yearning of your heart. Amen? Oh, I know sometimes we have bad days and our mind wanders. I'm not trying to stomp you down into the dirt. I'm just trying to help you to think through, where is my standing with God today? How about this one? Number four, to what or to whom do you offer your greatest sacrifice? I have no illustrations of that. It's just a question. To what or whom do you offer your greatest sacrifice? Number five, what possesses your will? The greatest gift besides life that God gave to us is the power to make up our own minds and to choose. It's called free will. So what possesses your will? Your will is your guide and reveals. God. Number six, does Jesus reign without rival in your heart? Did you hear the full question? Does Jesus reign without rival in your heart? Is he the bridegroom of your soul? Is he the sunshine? Does he reign without rival? On Sunday evenings, we've been looking at Abraham on a Wednesdays. We've been looking at the story of Abraham in the Old Testament. Recently, we've looked at the fact that Abraham was old and Sarah was old, and yet God promised that they were going to have a child. And finally, they thought, well, evidently, it's not going to be Sarah because she is past childbearing years. And so they decided, and Sarah decided, I guess you could say, to offer a concubine to Abraham so he could have a son that he could leave his inheritance to. And sure enough, <clears throat> he had a son. And that son's name was Ishmael. But God said, no, that's not what I meant. I meant that Sarah was going to have a child. Ishmael is not the inheritor of the promise. The son through Sarah is going to be the son of promise. And sure enough, Sarah had a child even though she was beyond childbearing years. And they named him Isaac. Can you imagine how much he loved Isaac? He had been promised this child probably a few decades before that by God. 
When God said, I'm going to make you a great nation, out of your loins will, will, will come many nations of the world, and you'll be a blessing to all of the nations of the world. And he waited, and he waited, and he waited, and he waited, and it never happened. And finally the concubine happens, and, and then God comes and says, no, that's not what I meant. And gave him a child by the wife of his youth and his love, Sarah. And they bore Isaac. Wow. I can't even imagine the kind of love that he would have had for that child. But then when Isaac was nearly full grown, God gave him a very unusual command. And he said, I want you to take your son Isaac, whom you dearly love, and I want you to take him out and I want you to sacrifice him to me. Well, God didn't even believe in child sacrifice, so it kind of astounded everybody. But Abraham, in obedience, he took Isaac to a place of sacrifice. He bound him, meaning he tied his hands and his feet so he couldn't resist, and he laid him on the altar, and he took his knife, and he prepared to sacrifice his son Isaac to the Lord. But when he was in full strike, I mean, he was coming down for that final blow to sacrifice Isaac to the Lord, and an angel caught his hand, and he said, No. This is not what God wants. And he refused to allow him to sacrifice his son. Recently, the church world lost, I think, one of the most incredible theologians that I have ever heard, and that was Rav, Rav, Ravi, Ravi Zacharias, R-A-V-I, Ray, R-A-V-I, Ravi Zacharias. Most incredible theologian I've ever heard. I would listen to him on YouTube, and he was the kind of guy, he'd get up there, and he would allow all the, all the non-Christians and the atheists at universities, universities to come and to challenge him with questions, and he would answer their questions, and it left them without response and answer. I mean, this guy was, and, and I think, I'm not sure about this, but I think he actually at one time was a Hindu, and uh, not a Hindu, but a... Um, a Muslim and he converted into Christianity because he would also do the same thing with Muslims he understood their faith and he was very familiar with this story of of Abraham going and and, and attempting to sacrifice his son but he made the most incredible statement because I've always wondered why why God would have had him do this and Rave Rave Zacharias I'm gonna have to quit saying his name until I get new teeth, he made, this, he made this statement. He said, God did not want Isaac. God wanted Abraham back. Isn't that awesome? God wanted to know if Abraham was willing to sacrifice to God what he held dearest to his heart in this world. And that's the same question that comes to you and I today. When you take spiritual inventory, are you willing to sacrifice to God if you were called to do so? Are you willing to sacrifice to God that which you hold dearest, no matter what it is in this world? That's the question that he brings down to us today. And as you take your spiritual inventory, I remind you, God will entertain no rivals. I've asked Carol to come, and we're going to sing together page number 417 in closing today. And just kind of ask yourself the question, you know, if this is your testimony today, do that spiritual inventory. You know what's closest to your heart. And I'm not saying God's calling you to sacrifice it. I said, if he did, if he did. Let's stand as we sing this in closing together today. If you feel a need to come and pray at the altar, you can feel free to come as we sing this together. Jesus, my Lord, will love me forever. 
him no power of evil can sever he gave his life to ransom my soul now i belong to him now i belong to jesus jesus belongs to me not for the years of time alone but for eternity once i was lost in sin's degradation jesus came down to bring me salvation lifted me up from sorrow and shame now i belong to him now i belong to jesus jesus belongs to me not for the years of time alone but for eternity joy floods my soul for jesus has saved me freed me from sin that long had enslaved me his precious blood he gave to redeem now i belong to him now i belong to jesus jesus belongs to me not for the years of time alone but for eternity i'm going to give some careful instructions i'm going to ask Lindsay just to remain there if she would service is over but prayer time isn't and uh as we dismiss for prayer today, I'm going to ask Luther and Greg. They'll go out there. They'll represent me and, uh, and greet you as, you as you leave. I'm going to ask uh, Greg to dismiss us with prayer. And those that would like to come and spend a few moments in prayer with uh, Lindsay and Jenny, and I plan on doing an anointing, if you would like to be a part of that, we invite you to come at this time as Brother Greg dismisses with prayer.